What if I were to tell you that there was a shadowy figure who to this day remains a mystery to most, raised in the confines of a wooden cottage with no running water in central Poland, strange and misunderstood by most, but an incredible inspiration to many others, a man who created videos on YouTube starting over 12 years ago, the original YouTube music channel, will you, but who seemingly all but disappeared five years ago from the internet altogether. Some speculated he had died or was possibly the first true to life interplanetary visitor. This is Great Synth Mysteries, episode two, the story of Jexus. On February 9th, 2006, a video appeared online entitled Essentia or The Essence, a bird, a picture of a lake at magic hour, a haunting synth pad, and one minute and 40 seconds of something straight out of a 1980s sci-fi feature film. This was the beginning, and most fittingly, the first comment on the video from nine years ago reads, creepy, I like it. One month later, Crew, AKA Blood, is uploaded. Five minutes and 30 seconds of visuals and sounds take you to a whole other darker place. Then, one minute, 18 seconds in, pulsing drums, driving bass, what could be a mouse struggling to swim, solar flares, pre-90s high-tech machinery, and possible experiments on the human body. Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey could have learned a little something from the soundscape. Skip to 515 and enter a sweet pad, all created by synths, of which the poster doesn't name. This is the beginning of Jexus, or W.C. Olo Garb, as we've experienced him. His birth, life, and sunset. A figure who is known more for the sounds of his synths than his actual story. After many months, I was able to gain his trust, and he shared his story. This is that story. On November 17, 2006, the first appearance of a physical synthesizer was uploaded. This video featured the Cork Poly 6. Two batteries are shown affecting the sense filter, taking it from mild resonance to extreme, almost screaming once the mysterious operator comes into frame. He affects it with his tongue, all crescendoing with the last tone, and then silence. To understand this mysterious man in the video, we must first start at the very beginning, because without context, the dive into the depths of Jexus's departure cannot be fully understood. The year is 1982, and we're taken to a small Polish town. Now, this was a different time, and Poland was just post the martial law state placed on them in 1981. The small community he lived in was able to procure products like records and VHS tapes from the West, but they were shared amongst the members of the community. Jexus himself found an incredible fondness from films like Rambo and Robocop. Playing these over and over, he was intensely influenced by the sci-fi orchestra come synth soundtracks of the time. Gaining access to certain pieces of technology was difficult then, and the kids of that small town, as a result, had to try feverishly to get their hands on any VHSs that were available. The jump to 1991 and the release of Terminator 2 Judgment Day, scored by Brad Fidel, was the signature film leaving Jexus with what he considers the themes, music, aesthetics, and overall vibe of his existence. This imagery has not left his memory or ceased to affect his imagination ever since. As with many kids, he had his fair share of tough times at home. His parents divorced in 1994, saying, quote, the small circle of seemingly intelligent and educated people steadily spiraled into emotional madness. He was also bullied like many of us can relate to. Being skinny and bad at sports didn't help his case. He listened to Marilyn Manson and Nine Inch Nails, recording any music video that would air on television and scurrying around town to purchase all the magazines that featured stories on them. Funny how 10 years later, a member of Nine Inch Nails would read about Jexus on a synth forum and watch his video, seemingly bringing it all full circle. His mother would soon remarry a man named Paul, and this brought a person into Jexus' life that would introduce him to technology and, most importantly, the internet. Jexus discovered a website and subscribed to a newsletter from a music shop that would send out monthly catalogs showcasing their merchandise. Browsing the pages, he saw a Korg MS-2000 for 4,000 Polish Lotti, which back then was around 1,000 US dollars. Obviously at the time, this was insane, as the average earnings where he was stood at around 1,800 Polish Lotti. Since these cents seemed to be a world away, he found himself content with window shopping. 
cutting out the pictures of the synths from the catalog and affixing them to his textbooks, but the urge to create was bubbling under the surface. His first synth was a Yamaha PSS that he got for $10 from his class's prom queen and the mayor's daughter. Using his stepfather Paul's PC and some software he had acquired, Jexus began to record his first albums. Mashups of various samples, sequences made using the VAZ Plus, and sounds from his Yamaha PSS. He took his finished album and distributed it amongst his classmates at school. Funny how the inlay of the album proudly listed all the quote, gear he had used. Soon after, he started a band, and each member crafted their own instruments from materials that they could acquire. Buckets and coffee cans for a drum set, sound effects by retuning an old radio receiver, and the Bon Tempe 109 electric chord organ that Jexus labeled Elise's A6 on the rear. The Andromeda was just released, and well, the dreams of owning this bad boy were already strong in his mind. Years later, he would finally take ownership of the real deal. In 2001, enter the world of Allegro, the eBay of Poland. This was the start of the synth inception, if you will. Jexus was earning a monthly allowance of $150 from his mom and living a self-proclaimed hermit-like existence. It allowed him to save up even that tiny bit of money to purchase his first synthesizer, a Roland Alpha Juno and a Yamaha DX7 for 600 Polish Lati each. Though only one survived, as he sold the DX7 the next day for 1,000 Polish Lati due to being put off by the sound and architecture. He kept the Alpha Juno 2 for a bit, putting off the idea of making a profit for the opportunity to enjoy the sounds for a time. This purchase alone did not create the synth-obsessed Jexus of your imagination, because he was still enjoying the world of digital audio workstations, Synapse Orion specifically. He enjoyed it so much that hardware synths only really made it into songs as a cherry on top. The frustration of sync issues, dirty sliders, and certain synths lacked MIDI deterred him. Around this time, his life revolved around his studies at the university, making music and selling hardware synths. He was really getting into the bidding on Allegro thing, starting to take bigger risks, waiting until the last minute to bid on synths, discovering the buy it now option and maneuvering the game of buying and selling online with a new sense of skill. Though always being disappointed and frustrated when he failed to score the deal, the casual buying had become something of an obsession now. It was like searching for the holy grail, refreshing synth listings literally hundreds of times per day, making sure that no offer escaped his notice. Realizing that there would never be a way to clear the competition, another strategy had to be found. A light bulb went off, and the idea of placing ads in local newspapers interjects his mind. Placing these ads was free as long as you only placed one per week, which at the time was enough to lure in potential sellers. He never missed a week, constantly refining the contents of each ad. Keywords seemed to create different types of responses to his ads like looking for old keyboards, organs, synths, effects, and studio gear, Roland, Korg, Yamaha, Soviet, and other. Working or broken, cash will not buy Casio. He said he started with the words, organ or keyboard, as posting an ad with the word synthesizer was definitely not a widely used term, as he says, in most cases, they seem to call them keyboards with knobs, saying that if someone called and said they had a synthesizer to sell, the asking price would be immediately higher, clearly knowledgeable of what they had. Now, time kept moving and synths kept being purchased, but as time passed, the knowledge and hype for synthesizers grew in Poland and the bidding wars continued. This shows a different side of Jexus, for he likes to play a game and well, he calls this his game. Feeling that the prices and obsession for these instruments was getting over the top, he created an auction and trolled the synth fanatics. With a picture of two sequential circuits, Profit 5, the auction read as followed. I have these two obscure keyboards for sale. Found them in my uncle's attic. They don't even have speakers, so I want to sell or swap them for something that can actually be played, preferably a Casio. Feeling satisfied with this fun, Jexus sat back and awaited the responses. Emails flooded in. The buyers were losing their minds. All the potential buyers either calling him retarded or telling him he could have sold it for five grand. Only one person saw through the ruse and congratulated him on a joke well done. This person became a friend in the real world. His name is Adam, and Adam's game was buying and selling sense as well. When he finished having fun with one, he'd just sell it to Jexus.
In 2006, YouTube was in its infancy. By this time, Jexus owned around 15 cents, regularly reading the Matrix Synth blog. After browsing the scarcely posted synth videos, he decided now was the time to create one for himself. And on January 17, 2007, the first video featuring the Roland Juno 60 appeared. It was a success, but it was the second one featuring the Yamaha AN1X that really gained traction amongst the synth community. Jexus created patches in a different way than most at the time, wanted the patch's uniqueness and originality to stand out instead of playing a signature motif or melody. This was of course intentional on his part, but was also due to the fact that he had no formal music training to speak of. This probably led to the unconventionalness of his sound. The patches weren't always meant to be played, but were meant to be experienced or evolved over time. He said, quote, the classic synth music always seemed too sterile to me too machine-like, so I've always tried to make synth sounds more layered and organic, like a living organism. These videos had mild visual effects in the beginning. From my memory, the first video with tons of these VHS-like effects was the video featuring the Roland JX3P, with tracking artifacts and wild cuts and other B-roll footage. This video was created in 2007, but was squarely imagined in 1980. In his words, there is nothing uglier than a perfect, crystal clear, razor sharp picture. It hurts my eyes to watch. So he kept this aesthetic, the image we all know when we picture Jexus. He bought a Sony SLV757 VCR and a JVC JXC7 video corrector, a TitleMaker 2000 title generator, a Tamron TF60 WU processor, and the camcorder he had from high school, the Sony CCD TR713E. It was of course the digital era, but he would record to VHS, then feed it back onto a hard drive, play with the tracking and alter the tape to head angle to introduce the effects of battered VHS distortion. All this production value, all this work for videos on a website that was totally unproven at the time. People would ask how he achieved these real looking VHS effects throughout the years, which plugin, which effects suite, stating, it did not cross their minds that to get the best VHS effects, it is the easiest to use a VHS. Year after year, dozens of videos would continue to appear and the reviews would not stop until they ended just as they began. No announcement, no farewell, nothing. So we ask ourselves again, what happened? Stay tuned for the story of Jexus part two. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you on the next episode of Grey Synth Mysteries.